Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Dick Deming. I'm medical director of Mercy One Cancer Center and founder of Above and Beyond Cancer. Welcome to our weekly cancer education series. This series is brought to you in part by a grant from the Rosalie and Sherry Exline Ziegler Fund. Tonight, we're going to be talking about poetry and the healing power of the word. Um, my guest tonight is Karen Miriam Goldberg. Welcome, Karen. Welcome. Uh, thanks for having me, Dick. So glad to be here. So Karen uh, grew up uh, in Brooklyn, New York. I got her undergrad at uh, in New Jersey and then came to the Midwest. Uh, her bachelor's degree from the University of Missouri, and then master's and PhD at the University of Kansas in um, literature and writing and specifically poetry. And she served for four years as the poet laureate of the state of Kansas. So welcome to, uh, to our cancer education series. Also, she's a cancer survivor times two. So, so a little bit about you. Uh, Karen, did you always write and read? Was that something that even from the very beginning in kindergarten or even before that was an important part of your essence? Well, I always made something and created something. I was a kid artist and I did visual arts, drawing and painting and printmaking and collage and all kinds of things until I was about 14. And I actually turned to poetry because we had a, a particularly disruptive divorce going on in my house that was ripping apart my whole extended family and I, I needed words. And I found that writing and making something out of words was a path toward healing fairly early on in my life. Wow. So the, the, the power of poetry, um, what would you... What are some of the, the, the attributes of poetry that make it so powerful and such, um, such a healing art? Uh, thank you for asking that. That's a great question. I think about poetry sometimes as, you know, those little capsules you can drop in water and then they turn into sponge animals or sponge trucks or other such things that um, we can give these to kids or ourselves. I think taking a poem is, poem is like that. It lands in you and then it turns into something that you can't uh, anticipate ahead of time. And that's because poetry uses compressed and concise language that helps trip us and tilt us out of our habitual thinking so that we can see the world anew. I think poetry continually has the power of opening up our peripheral vision. And some would say that creative writing makes the invisible visible, but I think it also makes the visible visible. It gives us a much bigger perspective of the world happening in real time. Yeah, and, and it's in such uh, bite-sized chunks. I mean, compared to sitting down with a novel that might take you weeks, uh, that has many important um, uh, ideas, the poetry is so succinct and sort of points at ideas and does allow, even though, I mean, you're the poet, I'll have you tell me this, I'm mm -hmm. sure there's sometimes you intend a meaning, but, but the reader can bring their own experience into a page of verse that allows them to find meaning that maybe the poet was pointing at, but might be a bit different than was intended. Absolutely. And poetry is also one of the most democratic arts. Anybody can write poetry. And by aiming towards sensory images, what we can see, feel, hear, touch, taste, we kind of create this alternative world for the meaning, almost like a little house somewhere that each poem is. And then the reader steps in and the reader from there can kind of find their own meaning. And whether you're writing a poem or reading a poem, it gives you the opportunity to come to see more clearly what you know and how you know it. Yeah, and, and you, you mentioned both the 
healing power of writing a poem or reading a poem or listening to a poem. Uh, we were talking a bit about the integrative medicine program that we have where we brought in uh, some of the creative arts and there's music therapy, which as you know, is a trained counselor that use mu music as part of counseling, but there's also music as therapy where Absolutely. group listening or group drumming or group singing can can have therapy same with art and uh, i would say the same with poetry that there can be the healing power of writing poetry and the healing power of listening or reading poems absolutely and i actually got certified many years ago in poetry therapy and i know we're going to talk a little later about narrative medicine and some of those areas but I think what happens particularly um, when we draw upon poetry for healing, especially in community, is that it can be a force to bring people together. When we write something and then we read it out loud, we can feel the weight of our own words in a very powerful way. Um, having good witnesses helps us better understand who we are and where we're being led. And when it comes to the cancer journey, um, just trying to figure out what to do, what you know, the decisions anybody on this journey has to make uh, can be so important because as we know, when you get a cancer diagnosis, so often you just feel like you've been thrown on a medical treadmill and you're being pushed forward without the time to deeply reflect on what is happening and what are your choices and options and um, what can you what can you learn here how can you grow how can you open your heart how can you find meaning in your life no matter how difficult it is so for me the power of writing and community is that we learn not just to listen to each other but we learn to listen to and to trust our own voice yeah, there's a line in a Wallace Stegner um, novel, and I think he's quoting someone else, and I, I've forgotten who he's quoting, but it's, it's something to the effect, um, how do I know what I think until I see what I say mm -hmm. as he gets ready to sit down and journal? And, um, you know, we can uh, just perseverate and think we have a profound thought, and it goes round and round, but until we put it down on paper, and make it real, I think it does allow us to really um, define what it is that we're thinking and what it is we're feeling in a way that makes sense, not only to us, but to others who might read it. Absolutely. And then sometimes those words can stay with us and be talismans for taking us forth. I remember a student of mine many years ago had a line from a Theodore Rethke poem called The Waking. And the line was, um, um, uh, <laughs> suddenly I'm blanking out on the line. Um, I should say I'm three weeks out from COVID and I haven't recovered my whole memory. Um, but it's from a poem that begins, I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. And I'll remember the really great line eventually. But okay. sometimes just one nugget of a line can stay with us. Mm -hmm. And oh, of course, now I remember. The line is, what falls away is always and is near. So what we've lost in our life, it's, it, you know, the big losses, they're, they're close to us. They're tender. And um, I have found that just having a line like that sometimes can help carry us through. Yes, a line that I think of many times a day is, um, and whether we know it or not, the universe will unfold exactly as it should. That's and, a very good line to remember. Yeah, that's from Desiderata. Um, well, let's learn a little bit more about you. So um, it's one thing to like poetry. I probably was seventh grade, and the first poem that spoke to me was Casey at the Bat, where I got to recite it, memorize and recite it in, in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. So I just loved, uh, you know, I didn't know why I liked it, but obviously the meter and the cadence and the 
and the humor and the irony and the feelings that you know it evoked um so what was what was maybe one of the first poems that you were exposed to in your education that that made you stop and think about i i like poetry yeah well actually i first started reading rod McEwen, who a lot of poets would make fun of now but that just that was like my gateway drug into poetry. And then I fell in love with T.S. Eliot and E.E. E. Cummings. But right about that time, I discovered Elizabeth Barrett Browning and her sonnets from the Portuguese. And I remember sonnet number six, you know, go from me, but henceforth in your shadow. And then it kind of goes on from there. It just stayed with me. And there's a lot of power when you're young, when you're my age, when you're any age, in memorizing a poem and just feeling that in your body and that that cadence and those images and how they come alive over time. So it's one thing to like poetry, appreciate poetry. It's quite another thing to get a PhD and become a poet. So at what point did you have what I would call the courage to, to take a path that might not have an immediate job possibility when you finish school? Well, we could say there's almost no job possibility that I know of in making <laughs> income from being a poet, but you can make a life. You can find what the Buddhists call right livelihood, which is work that helps extend your gifts and um, helps you live close to your callings. Um, I started writing poetry, as I mentioned, when I was about 14, and I had a wonderful teacher in high school who encouraged me and helped me, and for me, that was it. It was poetry, but my father convinced me that um, because I liked to write, I could only go into journalism or advertising, which worked out well because it got me to the Midwest, where I feel much more at home than I ever felt in New Jersey or Brooklyn. Um, although I love to visit those places. And then I did work as a journalist for a number of years. And I also worked as a grassroots organizer with the labor movement and nonprofit organizations and social services. But it was always poetry. And eventually um, I fell in love with a man in Lawrence, Kansas. And there I was. And I realized, well, the university's here. So I'll go on and get a master's, and then I went for a PhD. Um, so it wasn't so much a matter of courage, but what I always wanted to do. And when I started doing my master's and I had a teaching graduate assistantship, I found out I had a twin calling, and that was teaching, mm -hmm. that I loved teaching, and that was something that was really fulfilling, that lit me up and was effective for those I worked with. And so I have followed that path. Um, I taught in higher education for 34 years, and now, now I teach and facilitate workshops and do collaborative projects as a post-institutional woman. Okay. And you were the Poet Laureate of Kansas, correct? Yes, I was. So how, how does one go about um, becoming the Poet Laureate and and what are your responsibilities as the Poet Laureate of Kansas? Well, I applied and I was chosen, but my term was a little different than most Poets Laureate um, because the Poet Laureate program was part of our state's arts commission. And the governor at the time, who I refer to as he who must not be named, dissolved the arts commission. But nobody told me I had to stop being Poet Laureate. So I, <laughs> I, I did fundraising and I carried the program in my pocket. And I had planned to do community building poetry workshops across the state, like Iowa, but maybe more so. Kansas is a big state. You know, you can drive for seven hours and you're still in Kansas. Um, but with what happened with the Arts Commission, writers and other artists really rose up and wanted to come out and and help impart to themselves to each other to the public how the arts are essential for our lives so 
we had poetry caravans that went all over Kansas. We published several books. We had a website and we would do readings in like way out southwestern Kansas or the northwest corner, you know, near Nebraska and Colorado and all over the state. And poets sometimes would drive four, five, six hours to meet with other poets and read one or two poems. And so my time was really about helping facilitate this community building and helping um, do what I could to co-hold the space for us to lift poetry up and to ferry the program to a safe harbor. And by the end of my term, I was able to land it with the Humanities Council of the State, which housed it for a number of years. And now the Poet Laureate program is with a new arts commission that formed. So a lot of my work was keeping the Poet Laureate program alive. Okay. Well, let's talk a bit about your cancer journey. You shared with me and, and I invite you to share with our audience um, your cancer journey. And you've had at least two cancer journeys, a, a breast cancer journey that began in about 2002, and then um, a melanoma of the eye, ocular melanoma. Um, let's talk first about your your breast cancer journey, if you wouldn't yeah, mind sharing a little bit. People, um, I've had one of the most common and one of the most rare cancers. Um, my mother and my aunt each had breast cancer three times. Um, well, my mother twice, actually, my aunt three times. And I did not know it at the time, but my father and uncle who passed away from pancreatic cancer have had the BRCA one genetic mutation, which I unfortunately have. So I was shocked at age 42 when I had breast cancer. And then, you know, sometimes cancer can be news that keeps getting worse. I thought it would be um, a lumpectomy and a little radiation, but it was already at stage two. And so I went through six months of very intensive chemo and a double mastectomy, and because um, of the BRCA genetic mutation, some other issues, a hysterectomy, and while we're on the ectomies, an oophorectomy, ovaries taken out. And so that, the physical journey was about 14 months long, but I was writing all through that, and I started facilitating workshops for people living with cancer toward the end of that. And before your own cancer diagnosis, had you um, intentionally and overtly worked with cancer survivors or cancer patients around creative writing or around poetry? Or, or did that only happen after your own diagnosis? I hadn't, but um, right around the time my daughter was born, and she's 30 now, hard to believe, I started facilitating writing and healing workshops in the community. I knew that writing was an essential part of my healing process and that there were others who felt the same way. So I did all kinds of workshops for many years. Um, I worked with women at a housing authority, low-income women in recovery from abuse and addiction. I worked for a year in a workshop that paired together um, elders, women in a retirement center with um, at-risk teenage girls who were largely motherless and they wrote together and I'd walk in and find a teenage girl in an older woman's lap reading poetry together. And I had many powerful experiences with workshop facilitation and also starting to teach others how to facilitate effective workshops. And if I understood the timeline right, all of that workshop experience happened after your own cancer diagnosis. Is that right? No, no. This was all before my diagnosis. Okay. Yes. And um, so this all started about 1995. And then um, my last visit during treatment with my oncologist, a wonderful guy named Dr. Matt Stein, he said, anything else? And I said, yes. Can I start facilitating writing workshops here? And so he set me up, and then I also started working 
with the center we have in the Kansas City area, similar to yours. It's called Turning Point, the Center for Hope and Healing. It's now part of the University of Kansas Medical Center. And I started facilitating workshops there for people living with serious illness, cancer, MS, heart disease, and so on, as well as their caregivers, because I think caregivers, I know watching what my husband went through, caregivers sometimes have a much heavier burden or at least as heavy as patients. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and how would you describe the, um, the various ways in which writing, and I would be inclusive of, of individuals writing, but also being part of your workshop and listening to others and, and reading poetry. What are the various ways that you think it helps heal uh, individuals? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, well, I have ground rules that first of all, basically tell people you are the boss of you. You don't have to write poetry. You can write stories. You can write lists. You can write letters. You can write songs. And I think it's so important that people feel their own agency, their own autonomy, their own power to say whatever they want, how they need to say it. And um, another ground rule of mine is you never have to read aloud unless you want to. And while most people do, that also gives people a sense of they are doing this for themselves. So to kind of give you an example, we just had our first in-person workshop at Turning Point after three years of meeting on Zoom. And um, first of all, we always bring food and eat a lot. And um, not just because I'm Jewish and that's kind of part of my religion, but maybe part of many of our religions that you break bread together and there's that sense of community. But we always start with introductions that help people get to know one another. And then we do short writing prompts, 10, 15 minutes. And I'll sometimes read a poem and invite people to take a line from it or write in response but they can always write whatever they want. So again, that freedom to say what you need. And as far as how this really speaks to healing is so many people are not listened to well in this culture. And um, even among our beloveds, especially when there's a health crisis, it can be hard just to be well witnessed and to really feel what it is you're saying and from there, what's happening with you? So this creates a way for people to connect with what they're truly feeling, or sometimes we call it what's really driving the bus right now, to look at their, their motives and biases, their yearnings and fears, their deepest loves and joys. And in all of the workshops I do, we use writing that has a lift at the end. We use prompts that aim people toward writing about what has meaning for you. What do you consider beautiful, important? What do you love most? Where do you find your strength and courage and resilience? And so part of the healing, holding the healing space is to hold a brave space for people to say what they need to say. But also it's, it's so important to just kind of hold the space for, um, for people to connect with what may be beyond words, what might be just on the edge of what they're thinking, what kind of wants to come out and show it to themselves so that they have a better sense of who they are and where they're coming from. Yeah, and one other thing I'd like, I'd like to add, if you don't mind, is that... Um, Although at Turning Point, we focus more on physical illness. As we all know, the, the mind and the body are connected. And so having a space where people can talk about being really depressed or anxious or terrified or having mental illness in their background or their family also takes the taboo off of that and lets people feel more whole. Um, so the whole thing together lets people see the wider spectrum of their life 
beyond just being a patient. Yeah. So part of what I'm hearing you say is part of it is is dedicating a time and a space for opening up and listening, allowing uh, an individual to process and have time to to say what they're thinking and think what they're thinking and then put it into words. We talked a little bit about the art of narrative medicine that, mm -hmm. you know, in, in American medicine, a doctor and patient get in a room and the average time that the patient gets to speak before being interrupted is 23 seconds. And oh, narrative gosh. medicine is the idea that we provide within the doctor patient uh, a meeting mm -hmm. a space and an opening for individuals to uh, say what they're really, what's important to them, what uh, makes them tick, what are their goals, what brings them joy, and that we as doctors, knowing that information about them can be much better at helping them sort through options and help guide them as to which option might meet their goals. But if we don't know what their goals are and their what their, mm -hmm. their uh, um, desires are, it's hard to really serve them in the best possible way. That is so, so true. And when I got my first uh, cancer diagnosis, my oncologist at the time, Dr. Stein, he said, we will stay with you as long as you need. And I, our visit, my husband and I visited with him for two hours. He had to go work with other patients, but he'd bring in a pharmacist excuse me, or a nurse or others for us to talk to. And we really felt like we were heard deeply. And that had a profound effect on me. And narrative medicine, of course, is finding those narratives that um, tell, help us tell our stories of illness, our stories of health. And it also reminds me of an old Yiddish saying that anything can be survived if it's part of a story. So seeing the framework of our stories can be a very effective way for moving forward. Um, Karen, you mentioned that sometimes in your writing workshop, workshops, you might share a poem and that that poem that your uh, the people participating might reflect on that poem and use that as a, uh, a springboard for their own writing. Do, do you happen to have a poem that you brought with you that you'd like to share with us, maybe as an example of a poem that you might use in one of your uh, writing as healing workshops? Well, you know what I do have? I don't have any of my handouts right with me, but I have a poem I wrote in response to what they were writing. Um, and this was a poem by Louise Gluck um, about survival. It's called Snowdrop. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it has the line in it, at the end of my suffering, there was a door. And so we all wrote about this, and this was my response, which is also about what happens in writing workshops. There is a door. And then the quote from Louise Gluck, at the end of my suffering, there was a door. Always across the once green expanse, hilling the horizon, invaded by cedars leaning into each other in the sun, right before the wind returns to clear us of all the humidity, the righteous angst of being human, which is not to say it was easy. We were trapped there like hurricanes stationed in place against their will to dissolve into oceans. We were afraid often of it never ending, pain so fluent in speaking the language of forever. We were separate from each other below the surface of so much sadness that even the dra dragonflies avoided us. Or we were lost in the timbers of hurt, piercing our temples or aching in our calves, keeping us awake no matter how hard we kicked. It didn't, doesn't matter if we cried out or tightened the long vertical muscles in our necks to hold in our curses or screams or if we felt nothing but the bank of fog becomes an ocean so deep and tilted away from the light that we thought we lived here. Somehow, a miracle, a piece of luck, 
a strange happening. There was a door, and then on the other side, we found each other. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. I love that that uh, threshold at the end, you know, to yeah, cross over. Um, so as I was researching um, you in, in anticipation of this conversation, I came across a poem a few weeks ago, and I actually used it as a reflection for a meeting. And it's a uh, lilac, and it was, I think, uh, written after your uh, double mastectomy. Do you have that with you? Would Would yes, you be willing to share, right here. share that poem? And which okay. book is that published in? This is all from, um, let's see, How Time Moves, which is new poems and selected poems. So it has the best of all my books in it. Um, and I will say this poem has a little bit of a story. It's completely true. <clears throat> I came home from the hospital after my double mastectomy, and we had three little kids. Things were a bit chaotic. The house was a mess, and I just got furious. And I grabbed the clippers and went over to my mother-in-law's. We live in the country, and she's like just a little bit down the road from us. And this is what happened. Lilac. The day after they cut my breast off, just home from the hospital, not even napping or talking on the phone yet, that day I walked on my own two legs down a dirt road over the slope of loose rock, cradling as I walked the broken body, the large orange-handled clippers, the big wind holding me, the man I loved behind me getting ready to start his car to come get me, that day beginning the healing from all of it, unslashed from the expectation of what knife or infusion comes next, was the day I made my way to my mother-in-law's old-fashioned dark purple lilac and reached against the tightness of gauze and paper tape, against the odd sensation of parts removed and scars just making themselves against my sore arms reaching toward their old strength to gather and hold to cut and cut and cut all i could fill my arms with all the dark purple alive with death and birth loss and blossom and the white ones too my arms filling with the explosion of lilac my life filling with wind and weight of branches all of it against upon my open chest, all of it ready to be carried into the next life that starts right now. Oh, that's beautiful. And there again, we end with a threshold of mm -hmm. uh, ending and uh, with a new beginning that starts right now. Um, that's, that's so beautiful. And it, um, it really, I can see the dressing on your chest i can you know feel the tightness as the scars are just beginning to form and uh, obviously the parallel of your breasts having been cut off and you are now cutting the flowers with a, a sharp object um how how long did it take you uh to actually compose this and you know you're telling a story that really really did happen but to figure out how you were going to mix the um oh the mutilation and the trauma that you had experienced with this uplifting coming back with arms full of of flowers ready to start mm -hmm. your new life well i believe that um poetry tends to really come alive when we completely surrender and stop thinking about the ideas that we want to convey. There's nothing that will kill writing a poem faster than wanting it to be a certain thing. So I aim toward images and this image just grabbed me. And I probably wrote the first draft quickly. Um, Anne Lamott has a great book called Bird by Bird. And um, I hope it's okay to say that she has a mini chapter called Write Shitty First Drafts. <laughs> Just get it out there any way you can. Um, I don't know how much I revised it because I tend to revise poems somewhere between 10 and 20 or more times. I just go in and tweak it here and there. 
and then I read them aloud and I just try to hear the rhythm. There's um, a poet I really loved, love. his name is Lee Young Lee. And he talked about in an interview that he feels the rhythm of the poem in him first and then the words. And he said, it's like the rhythm is the power line and the words are the birds that land on the power line. Mm -hmm. So that was a poem I definitely felt the rhythm of before I had the words. Mm -hmm. um, when you were going through the six months of chemotherapy prior to your surgery, and, and I take it that you had three little children too, I, I just uh, am amazed that you can find the time to write, go through chemotherapy, take care of the household duties, raise three kids and still find time to write. Did your, um, did you have to dedicate specifically time for your writing while you were going through chemotherapy? Did, did you end up, you know, of necessity not writing as much while you were going through chemotherapy? What was your relationship to your own writing while you were going through your cancer treatment? Well, I have to say that I have an incredible husband and He's been just unbelievable through my first cancer and the second cancer, the ocular melanoma or eye cancer was excruciatingly painful and far more mysterious and scary to us. And he's just been amazing with that. And I've lived in Lawrence, Kansas for a long time and we have such, an, such a great community and a lot of friends and some family here. So I can't say I was doing it on my own. Um, through our local Jewish center and other friends and community, I actually had four people who stepped forth and they organized meals and helping drive my kids around. And one of them was even in charge of, um, she was my PR person. She would communicate with people as to what was going on. This was in the days before we had the Caring Bridge um, website for sharing news. And so, um, I just had such astonishing support. One of my best friends was a math professor who was on sabbatical. She came with, with, with me to each um, chemo appointment. And I also worked very close with an energy healer, a dear friend who came with me to chemo appointments and worked on me. And the kids had a lot of support. So it wasn't so much of me holding up everything on my own. It definitely took a village. But during uh, the first cancer, I mostly wrote prose, uh, journal entries about weird dreams and sensations and how I was doing. And I would bring those pages into my oncologist and with my permission, it became part of my medical files and uh, which are probably, I don't know, five or six inches thick at this point. And I called those journal entries chemo pause because of course chemo had me visit the land of menopause where I then surgically got to move um, after I finished chemo. So um, I had a good witness and I had just all kinds of things I was writing and chemo pause kind of became the center of um, a memoir I wrote called The Sky Begins at Your Feet, which is about cancer and community and coming home to the body. Even if the body is living a story we never mm -hmm. wanted it to live, mm -hmm. we never remember signing up for. Um, cancer definitely forces us to reckon with what does it mean to be a body. Yeah. Um, what um, poems, what poets or writers did you turn to for comfort or solace or wisdom? You mentioned Louise Gluck. Um, are there other poets or writers that you find yourself um, in times of introspection that you you grab off the shelf or that you uh, open uh, and and search for wisdom, solace, mm -hmm. inspiration? Um, absolutely. And uh, Joy Harjo, who is a, a incredible poet, um, she was the U.S. Poet Laureate for four years. She was somebody I turned to over and over. And also um, William Stafford. And I do have one of his poems here, if you would indulge me in sharing that with you. Um, 
because it's a poem I turn to a lot during cancer. And yes. Yeah. It's called You Reading This Be Ready. And Stafford is from Kansas, even if he lived most of his life in Oregon, we, we claim him. And he was the first U.S. Poet Laureate. So, you reading this, be ready. Starting here, what do you want to remember? How sunlight creeps along a shining floor? What scent of old wood hovers? What softened sound from outside fills the air? Will you ever bring a better gift for the world than the breathing respect that you carry wherever you go right now? Are you waiting for time to show you some better thoughts? When you turn around, starting here, lift this new glimpse that you found. Carry into evening all that you want from this day. The interval you spent reading or hearing this, keep it for life. What can anyone give you greater than now, starting here, right in this room, when you turn around? And there's so many, so much I love about this poem. I often think, are you waiting for time to show you some better thoughts? And my answer is often if I'm asking that, yes, I am. But also the gift of right here, um, right now, uh, this is what we have. This is you know, for better or for worse. Uh, in the middle of one of my cancers, I saw a bumper sticker that said, oh no, not another learning opportunity. But, <laughs> you know, that's that's how it is. And so um, one other poet I'll mention is Adrian Rich, um, one of my very favorite poets. And she has a poem called, these are, well, it has the line, these are the materials. And she actually talks about abuse and degradation and all these horrible things happening in the world. But then she talks about the moon rising and frogs calling and how um, these are the materials. What's difficult, what's impossible, what's beautiful, what's heartbreaking, what's pure love. These are our materials. So. Um, seeing that more clearly gives us a little more power and a little more courage to consider what we want to do with our life's materials. Yeah. So one of the poets that I turn to, um, to share with patients, but also that, that I turn to for in, introspection and, and reflection is Mary Oliver. And she just has oh, she's so, so many, and in particular, her own cancer poem. Um, are you familiar with the fourth sign of the Zodiac? The, um, yes, yes. yes. And she's just an amazing poet. And I've used so many of her poems in workshops too. Yes. And I'm so glad you're familiar with her. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the workshop and the mm -hmm. poetry festival that you're going to be taking part here in Des Moines, Iowa. So Poetry Palooza is coming up April 6th through the 8th, and um, it will include several different events, several uh, poet laureates, uh, poets laureate uh, from various Midwestern states, including Karen Miriam Goldberg from Kansas. And uh, part will be some education with some students and part will be a poetry slam contest. Um, and on uh, f Friday night, the 6th, and then on the 8th, there are going to be some workshops, including um, Karen Miriam Goldberg doing a workshop on the healing power of poetry. And that will be in the morning at the Mainframe Studios on August 8th. So can you give us a little bit of sample or a, a little bit of a, of a preview of what would happen if um, those of us in the room showed up for the uh, Poetry is Healing workshop that you'll be conducting on April 8th here at Mainframe's, Mainframe Studios in downtown Des Moines? Well, thank you so much. And I welcome everybody with open arms. Um, this is a workshop that whether you write all the time, whether you've never written poetry or much else, but you'd like to try your hand at it, whether you consider yourself a professional or 
it's something that you never even thought about before. If it speaks to you, please come. Because I find that when we can speak about what's truest and what's strongest for us, the writing is powerful. And what will happen is that after we do introductions and we share ground rules, which I talked a little earlier about my ground rules, but another ground rule is also confidentiality. And everybody who comes is protected to participate at the level that speaks to them. Then we'll try our hand at probably two different writing prompts where, you know, I'll read a poem or give you another prompt and you'll have 10 minutes to just kind of write what comes to you in a first draft and then to share it either in a small group or all together, depending on our numbers in the room. Everybody who comes will also get a very ample handout with all kinds of prompts and some resources that you can try out on your own. So it's a hands-on experiential workshop where you get to see what you have to say more to yourself, what you might want to share with others, and what the power of writing can mean in your life. And if it's already part of your life, how you might develop your relationship with writing and writing as a healing practice even more. And in that workshop, um, there'll be the opportunity to for for individuals to share their writing if they choose. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Um, you and mentioned oh, at the beginning of our conversation, you talked about that you actually, as a young child, before you were formulating poems, that uh, visual arts were something that maybe first uh, allowed you to recognize that you had this affinity or that you you received something positive out of participating in the arts. I'm curious, do you still uh, pr um, pr produce visual art? Um, and how would you compare and contrast what you learn about yourself in creating visual art compared to what you learn about yourself in composing writing? Well, I do. And I have... Um... I have a quilt I need to sew a back on. I make very simple quilts, just straight lines going one way or another um, because I love fabric and color. And I also do drawing. Um, in the past few years, I've just been drawing birds because, you know, birds, what could be more amazing? Um, I like to use colored pencils. I've gone through different stints of using gel pens on watercolor paper to make mandalas or I went through many years of doing a whole lot of collaging. Um, but for me, the visual arts are a way to step outside of words and just play and relax. It's much more meditative. I'm not a professional artist in any way. And the quality of my work is probably nowhere near that um, the level of many wonderful professional artists, but it's just, the idea of making something, of playing with color and texture that lifts me up. With writing, this is also a meditative and a spiritual practice for me, but at the same time, I'm also using my writing to uh, continually craft it with the intention of putting it out there in some form. So maybe my best way to explain it is I've kept a blog for I don't know, 14, 15 years. It's on my website and it's called, um, it's just called Everyday Magic. And I also have a collection of those essays um, from the website there. And I do the blog as my own spiritual and emotional writing practice, but it's also to put it out there in the world. You mentioned um, partway through that, that you are, Jewish, and you mentioned it in the context, I think, of food, but mm -hmm. obviously also in the context of poetry and the Psalms. And, and I guess my question is, do you draw on your uh, spiritual background through the poetry of the Bible or the Bible as language? And, and has that over time... Mm -hmm played a bigger or smaller yeah. um, influence in your life? and, and Well, and yeah, I would answer with, I sure do. My first collection of poems is called Lot's Wife, and I took 
biblical stories, Greek and Roman myths, folk tales, fairy tales. And then I wrote um, new endings or new perspectives, especially from women who were largely um, silenced in those stories. Like I have Cinderella's mother talking back and I have a poem about Leah, who was the first wife of Jacob um, and who only married her to get to her sister, Rachel and so on. Um, and of course, Lot's wife is a story of somebody being turned into a pillar of salt for looking back. And I always thought that doesn't make sense. There can be a lot of compassion in looking back. I write some poems that are very focused on Jewish ritual. Um, my religion is very important to me and I, I find a great deal of meaning in exploring writing that way. And the one thing I'll share is that um, in Judaism, there's a tradition called Midrash, which is to read traditional stories or teachings, um, holy text, and come up with your own interpretation and often argue about it vehemently. And it, this is really at the heart of what Judaism is, that you, you engage with the word and you find your own meaning. And so there's a long tradition of Midrash focused poetry. So poetry that kind of helps us re-examine what we believe, what we've encountered from teachings and what's holy and what's true for us. So I also right. do that. Right. That's, yeah, interesting now that you mentioned bringing your own interpretation into what you're reading and, and that, that that's a valid to have a conversation about, you know, what does this poem mean or what does this story mean? You know, we're going to open it up. We've got a few minutes left. And Karen, if you're okay with taking sure. some questions. So we've got a live studio audience here in the room. And we also have individuals that are watching live streaming. So if you're watching this live streaming, if you could put your question into the comments section. And uh, we'll start with a question from the audience here. And I couldn't hear the question, if you can repeat it. Here we go. George is going to has the first question. Yeah, for you. I'm always interested in the, the close correlation between poetry and music lyrics. Uh, have you ever mm -hmm. had your poetry uh, set to music? And uh, does, that, does it diminish the poetry somewhat to have the music involved, or does it enhance it, or is it just a completely different medium that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I would say all of the above. I have had poems set to classical music, what's called art songs by um, composers. And that's been an incredible thrill. But I also co-write with an incredible rhythm and blues singer named Kelly Hunt. I know she plays in Des Moines every so often, so look for her. It's K-E-L-L-E-Y, -L -L -E Kelly with two E's. And um, when we're writing, she'll always say, less words, Karen, get to the heart of it quicker. <laughs> um, um, I co-write with um, Catherine Lorenzen, another wonderful um, singer-songwriter, and I love collaborating with people. It is different in a way. Um, you kind of have to get to what you're saying more quickly. Um, songs, um, at least folk songs or rhythm and blues or whatever, Americana music, that I'm writing, we're focusing more on um, the song having a hook, some line that jumps right out. I'm also interested in, in where you live, uh, the rural isolation. Do you find that to be beneficial as far as poetry, as far as creating is concerned? I find it to be incredibly beneficial, but I also kind of have the best of both wor worlds. I live on um, family land that's been in my husband's family for five generations and we're just about at the point of putting the whole thing in a conservation easement. It's 130 acres that we've been preserving for years, but I'm 20 minutes from downtown Lawrence. So um, I'm out in the country and I can go eat Indian food for dinner if I want. Um, but I do a lot of my writing outside and um, it sounds like you have a sense of that too, George, that Right. I grew up on a dirt road, so I, I kind of know what that's like. The last question I had is uh, kind of out of right field, but I always think about the uh, the Voyager, the satellite. They put music and human artifacts up there maybe to communicate with, the, you know, mm -hmm. 
alien someday or so. I don't know, but as a as a human record, is there any poetry up there of the, you know, that's that's definitely a big part of the human experience. If you wanted to tell someone who we are, poetry would be an excellent way to do it. Has that been done? I don't know, but you know, poetry goes back to the oral tradition and the first poems were, um, you know, if you look at Beowulf and some of those very old poems, and that's just from the um, Anglo-Saxon tradition, um, the first poems were written in ways that you could remember them. They had alliteration or rhyme or some kind of rhythm to pass on information. So it's really our oldest record of how we how we pass on capsules of information. We have another um, question. Yeah, just to kind of tether on to what George was saying about lyrics. And I grew up in a musical family, so writing songs and stuff. But I was I took creative writing in high school. And so when the cancer hit me, um, I wrote one. I can't even find it anymore. But I guess it was just meant for that moment. And I read it to a friend. And she goes, he goes, isn't poem supposed to rhyme? <laughs> and they go, well, what was it? <laughs> concerned about that it's about the message and when you talked about the rhythm i get what you're saying i just can't get friends to understand that too and um but i titled it when when cancer came at my front door and yeah, uh in more or less yeah and it was just kind of confronting it because it it it, it attacked yeah. both sides of the family and now it's at my front door and it was kind of a challenge kind of and, mm -hmm. and I've had friends going, well, do you want to add music to it? And I go, no, I don't see it like a lyrical. I, yeah. I know coming from a musical family, it would seem that would be the next step, but that's not what it was meant for. And I like listening to what you were saying um, about that. And you would say too, right? Poetry doesn't have to be a rhyming. Lyric. No, not at all. And there are people who write rhyming poems. I even have one or two out there. Um, they're called formalist poets. But most of us write in free verse that doesn't rhyme. But all poetry is a form of art that's halfway between music and visual arts. It looks a certain way on the page, but it also has its music. And the poems I read you out loud, you could hear the music of the poems. So, yes, yes. So I can see you in... In your 10, 10, 11th, 12th revision with uh, putting a comma someplace to get a little bit extra pause or something like Absolutely. that. It, it make a world of difference. Well, I, I would love to continue this conversation, but we're going to have to delay our continuation till August, uh, till April 8th. So um, we've been talking with a uh, poet. Uh, laureate for Kansas, uh, Karen Miriam Goldberg. And uh, Karen is a two-time cancer survivor. And she's going to be in Des Moines for Poetry Palooza, April 6th through the 8th. And there will be activities going on uh, all three days. You can go to the website Poetry Amp. So that's poetryamp.org, and you can see the entire schedule. Uh, Karen is going to be leading a workshop on April 8th in the morning at the Mainframe Studios on the healing power of poetry. And uh, I'm looking forward to that in particular, but there'll be other uh, opportunities April 6th through April 8th for Poetry Palooza here in Des Moines. So thank you, Karen, for being our guest this evening. Thank you so much. And any of you, if you come to um, Poetry Palooza, please come up and introduce yourselves. I'd love to meet you. Thank you so much, Dick, for all you're doing. It's truly life-giving and lifts all of us up. Well, thank you, Karen. And thanks you to all of you who attended. If you know someone that would benefit by listening or watching this program, it will be available tomorrow at the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel or at the Mercy Cancer Center website. Please join us again next week. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you. Bye.